Hi there once again and welcome to another Expresso Mechanic tutorial and this is the first in a two-part series on building a punch card reader. In order to achieve this we're going to be using a combination of Expresso and a fair amount of Python and we'll also be looking at an aspect of Python that we've never checked out before in any previous tutorial and that will be dictionaries. We'll be looking at those in part two. In part one our focus is going to be on building the card itself and encoding the message into it and the scanner which you can see descending down its post will be building that and developing the first stage of the animation for it. That's what we're going to be about in this tutorial so without further ado let's see if we can make this happen. We start with a rectangle and in the width we make it 140 and the height 340. We can leave it set up along the XY plane, that's perfectly good for us and leave everything else as it is. So that's the starting point for our card. The next step is to grab a circle and we'll give our circle a radius of five centimeters. Moving on from here we'll get a cloner so I'll hold down the option key so that we get the circle directly in the cloner and the cloner needs to be set up as a grid that's fine we'll leave iterate as the clones that's absolutely fine there we won't worry about any of this our count value needs to be 7 by 17 by 1 and our size 20 by 20 by 0 and as you can see that's set us up with 17 rows of seven circles okay that's great that's the second step towards making the punch card the next step then is to select all of these and I'm just going to group them and name this originals at least I can if I can spell it correctly original owls that's better right so we've got all of those in there and I'm only doing this in case I make any mistakes so I'm going to copy these from there and then hide the originals and just close that up and I'll hide them in the render view as well it doesn't really matter at this stage but it's a good habit to get into okay great the next thing to do is to make all of them well, make the cloner editable if we just hit C there we've got all our circles and we can remove all of these from here so I'll just grab a hold of them drop them above it remove the cloner and then select the rectangle all of the circles by holding down shift and then hit C to make them editable everything is editable and then I can say connect objects and delete so that we've got a single object now at the moment you can see there's a bit of a, an issue here all we need to do is select our circle we want it linear but we also want to say none no intermediate points that's what we need here and make sure you do that because if you select any of these and try and play around with it when you do the next step you'll find it will bring your computer to its knees and I'm using an M1 Max uh, new machine so it still brings my machine to a, its knees if I use any of these so make sure you select none okay great so moving on from here then I'm going to hold down my option key and I'm going to select extrude straight away we get the extrude and I'm going to make the offset just two so we're well on the way to creating the punch card now and the next step is to encode the message into it so how do we go about encoding the message into the card well if we just switch to our front view so F4 so we've got the card there I'm just going to switch off the extrude so that we can see the card more easily well a punch card is actually a binary code I mean it works with binary so if we look at from the right hand side here to the left this will represent 1 2 4 8 16 32 and 64 in binary so what we need to do is encode the binary code of an ASCII character into this card on each row and if we just shut down cinema a minute I'll just 
move it out of the way and I'll move screen flow out of the way. Now I've got an ASCII table here in the middle of the screen. So I'm just going to click on that and hit space bar. And this is actually downloaded from Wikipedia. It's completely public domain. So there's no copyright issues with this particular file. OK, so if we come down to our decimals, now the decimals here are important. They're going to be used later. We don't need to worry about them too much at the moment. But they will be important to us in part two of this tutorial series. So if we look at the E here, we can see that its binary code is here. So it's 69 in decimal. So 64 here, 4 and, and 1. So 64, 4 and 1. And that will give us a letter E. Similarly, with, with I'm going to be encoding Expressor Mechanic with a space between the two words into the card. So the X down here, we can see that it's 88 and its binary code is 64, 16 and 8. And if you add those together, you get 88. So that's what we need to encode in the card. We need to go through this table and put the correct letters in to the card, just encode their binary codes into the card. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So let's bring cinema back. So what was our E for before I do that? So I want one zero 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 one zero one. OK, so we can do that one straight away. So let's go back and select our spline, go into points mode. And I said that I wanted one. So I need the 64 there. So I need to take out this. I need to take out this, this. So I've got 64. I'm down to four, which gives me 68. And I need to take out the two and leave the one. And that gives me 69 in binary, which is E in ASCII. So that's absolutely fine. And then I've got to encode the rest of it in the card. And I'm not going to bore you by doing that. So by the power of editing, I'll get it done and then I'll come back to you. And here we have it, our card finished and ready to go. And you can see that we've got the first word Expresso encoded here, followed by a space, which is 32 in binary. And then following that, we've got the word mechanic. It's all there. It's all going to work fine. And then this card, when it's complete, will now be readable by the scanner once we've got that all coded and programmed in. Fantastic. So we've got it that far. Go back to our 3D view, so F1. And now we can think about moving on to the next step. So moving on from here, I'm going to open my originals, place this in there. I'll rename this card so that I know what it is. And then I'll copy this once again from the originals and hit C to make the card editable. Great, that's fine. We don't need any of these, so I'm going to remove them and just leave it at that. What I will do is group the card into a null and call it punch card. I'll just hit F4, switch to my front view again, select the card. And what I'm going to do, I'm just going to move this up a little bit so I can see what I'm doing. I'm in points mode. I just want to check to make sure that I've got visible only checked off, which I have. Select these two points, these two corner points, and then start to move them down and hold shift. And I'll just move them down by 10. And that just gives me a little bit extra on the bottom of the card. And you'll see why a little bit later in the series. Just switch back to our 3D view. And that's the card complete. It's ready to go. The next step is to start developing the scanner, which is going to be used to read the card. That's where we're going from here. Once again, I'm going to hit F4 to switch to my front view and I'll bring in a null. Along the X axis, I'm going to make this minus 60. So my null is over here, which is lining up with these holes, which is exactly where I want it to be. In the tools menu, I'm going to come down to duplicate. I want six copies and I want them in linear mode. I want them to move 20 along the X axis. So I'll hit apply. And now I've got the copies that I want. So that's the first thing. And I can call these, I'm going to call these targets. 
one drop the null in there and I've got seven nulls which is what I need now we'll think about naming these a little bit later but for the moment I'm going to command drag to create a copy and call this targets 2 switch back to my 3d view so f1 and now I can think about placing these in the correct positions so what we'll do in fact I'll switch back to the front view for this because it might be easier if I select both of these and select the correct mode we can move them up so we want them level with the top row so if we start moving them and hold down shift we're moving them in five centimeter increments and we can bring them up to there and now they're aligning correctly with the top row so switch back to the 3d view f4 again or f1 i should say and let's just see where these are now we want to move them away from the card so the targets one will move over to here and this is just rough placement at the moment we can sort them out a little more accurately a bit later but that's fine so the targets are in the correct positions to actually work with the ray collision nodes or the ray collision node that I'm going to put in there okay so that's fine our next port of call is to build the scanner I'll bring in a cube in the X I'm going to make it 5 in the Y and the Z 20 the segments the X can stay as it is and the Y and the Z need to be 3 I'll switch to my front view and hit H so that we can see what we're doing and this cube I'm going to move it along the X 75 and that should be fine for us I'm also going to move it into position along the Y axis so I'll just drag it holding down shift until it lines up with the nulls and that's perfectly good the next thing we can do is make a copy of the cube so I'm going to call this scanner cube and drop it into the originals and again it's just in case I make a mishap and then command drag to copy it close up the originals okay fantastic so we've got it here we can then hit C to make it editable O to zoom in on the object and I'll switch to polygon mode in my selection tool make sure that I've got visible only checked on this occasion select these three hold down shift and select these three and then hit H so that I can see everything and then it will be D for extrude and 150 offset should be fine for this let's do that and it is fine 150 is okay there that gives us our scanner just switch to a front views to make sure everything is where it needs to be let's have a quick look see where we are uh, we can make it a little bit less than 150 by the looks of it let's uh, go a little bit closer yeah I mean it could be a little bit less than that couldn't it um, I mean that's an overall length though I mean it depends on whether we want just to go to this much I mean I, th I think we will actually I'm going to just make that 140 in fact 145 is what it should be 145 that should be spot on and it is it's that that distance between the card and there and the distance between the card and the end of the prongs is, is perfectly the same now that's great yep I'm happy with that right that's fine let's go into the top view so f2 and we'll see where the targets are and they're just they're a little bit off here and there I mean if you want to you can make these dead in the middle I mean by eye they're not far off actually um, but you know you can move them around a little bit if you wish to but it, it doesn't really matter that much that's that should be fine the way it is the next thing we need to do is group this into another null so option G to do that rename this scanner assembly and we can then think about putting the targets into here we'll put the targets actually inside the scanner cube because the scanner when the, when the cube moves it needs to take these targets with it so that's how things need to be set up thus far there's one last thing to do before we move on to the next stage and that's select 
our scanner assembly. Now in the Z, it needs to just move one centimeter in order to make, if we just switch to the top view, so F2, it, that was just to make the card equidistance if we just take that back you can see that's where the where the scanner was just doing that makes it equidistant or, or the card equidistance between the two prongs so that's perfectly good moving on from here then we can get a null we can name it espresso give it an espresso tag and think about the next step now before we actually go into the expression, what we need to do is rename our targets. I said that we would do this earlier. We just switch to the front view again, and we can see our targets. So this target over here represents 64. So I'm going to call it 64. This is just for the sake of knowing which target is where. It just makes life a lot easier if you know, rather than having them all named the same. Two and one. We need to do the same here. So 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, and finally 1. So that's all of those renamed and ready to go. Moving on from here, then, let's take a look at the Espresso. The first thing I'm going to do is bring in an iteration. So we'll bring one of those in. Its start will be 0 and its end value will be six. We can then get two linked lists, so I'll bring those in. Just command drag to create a second. And these, or the iterations out, can be plumbed into the index inputs of our linked lists. We now need to populate them with our nulls. So the top one will get 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, and 1. Click off the eyedropper, select our second linked list, and do the same again. And that's correct. So we've got both linked lists matching, and that's exactly what they need to do. Because, of course, we've got seven pairs of targets and we're going to be using a ray collision node and we need to ascertain as to whether the ray has passed through a hole in the card or whether it's actually hit the card so that's what we're about here we need to find out whether our targets are being impeded or not being impeded so moving on from here then we need to bring one of each of these in so i'll bring 64 from the top and one from the bottom just for the sake of making them different and then connect the linked lists and we'll give them object ports at the input stage. We can then think about the output stages of both of these. Now they need global position output ports. So we'll give them those and then command double click to make them bigger so that we can see what's going on. We can then just make the window a little bit bigger move the nodes over to the left and we can reach for the all important ray collision node at the moment it's got a yellow top because there's nothing plugged into it and what needs to be plugged into it is this punch card we'll give this an object port at the output stage and we can plumb it into the input object port on the ray collision and straight away our yellow top disappears we can then plumb the global position out of our 64 node here into ray point one and do the same with the output port or global position output port of one here into ray point two. So now we're sequencing through our pairs of nulls and the ray collision node is checking to see whether they've hit the card or whether they're passing directly through a hole without anything breaking the ray so that's perfectly good that's working exactly as it should be now if there is a collision it will output a one at this output so that tells us when there's been a collision the next thing we can do is bring in a compare node and what we're interested in actually is whether or not we've passed through 
the holes because the holes will give us a zero at the output stage. So we're comparing to equal to zero. So we don't need to change anything in the compare node. It's set up perfectly well for us. So that's as far as we need to go there. The next thing we're going to need is a Python node. So we'll bring one of these in. We'll now switch to a scripting layout. Open the Expresso once again. Get a hold of the Python node once again. Just move this out of the way and open in editor. Firstly, I'll remove this line of code because we don't need it. The global output one is fine at the moment, but it will be changed because what we're going to do in here is my usual trick. I'm going to take away all of the ports. OK, and we'll put our ports back in. The first port I'm going to add is going to be an integer. I'll also add a float. Now, if you're uncertain as to what your inputs actually are, your input types, you can always bring up the port information. But I think we'd best rename these as we go along, lest we do actually forget. This will be called frame. And you'll see what's going to happen a little bit later. This one I'm going to call card underscore pos underscore y. So card position y. I'll add another integer and we rename this one index. And I will add another integer and rename this bool. At the output stage, I'm going to add a float. Could have left the existing one there really, but start from scratch. Rename this move scanner. Command double click so that we can see our whole node and we're ready to start some work. Now, the bool we can actually connect up to the compare so they can be linked together. The frame, I'm going to get a time node. I mean, we could technically code a frame variable like we do with, well, quite often do with things like uh, Python effectors and stuff like that, but I won't on this occasion. It's just as easy to get a, uh, a time node in. Give it a frame port. I'll delete the time port and plumb this in here. So that's giving us our frames from the timeline. I'll worry about the card position in the minute and the index that they can be done. Well, I suppose the index, I might as well do the index actually, because the index actually is going to come from this iteration. So if we move that up a little bit, just um, move, I'm going to move this up a bit as well. Just It's just for the sake of keeping this tidy, really. Just move that up plumb the iteration into the index that's set up for us. And then the card position Y, that can be plumbed in, or rather it's right, it should, I've done that wrong really, I should call that scanner position Y, let's rename that, I should call that scanner position Y, scanner pos Y. I looked at that, I thought it's a bit weird. I'm not moving the card, I'm moving the scanner. OK, um, and then we can grab hold of the scanner cube here. Drag that in and get its position Y. It will be position, not global position. So its position Y is the all important one. And we can connect that there. So those are all connected and they're ready to go. Obviously, there's no code at the moment, so they're not going to be doing anything. And then with the move scanner, all we've got to do is drag in the cube once again and give this position Y and it's ready to connect up. I won't connect it up just yet. OK, so that's got things that far. The next thing we need to do is start coding. I'll just shut down the Espresso editor for now. So in here, we've got 
global move scanner is that's updated so that's the output from the python node we'll just clear this out and switch to python as well from here then we'll set up another global variable in fact we'll set up a few more global variables current underscore spy it's not current spy it's current scanner position y just a shortening of that global binary global value global trigger you can probably guess what that's for if you've done any of the previous tutorials using python and global start time okay so now we've got our global variables defined we can think about initialization the first thing I'm going to do is say binary is equal to and it will be 64 32 6 16 8 4 2 and 1 so that we're echoing what we've got going on here with the nulls moving on from here I will actually open up my Expresso editor with the Python node here I'm going to add some user data and it will be a spline so we'll call the data spline select a spline from here and command click to add a couple of points might as well get that done in here actually it's just a simple spline that we need point one set up at zero and zero on x and y and point two one and one on the x and y and with the tangents here i'm going to say oops i don't want that there what's going on there i just need to say minus 0.25 for that one and this one will be set at 0.25 so that's fine we can just hit ok and then the spline is ready to be dragged into the editor here and i can simply say spline is equal to op and if you've done any of my previous tutorials and i hope you've done many of them you'll know what this is for it will in fact be used in a range mapper a little bit later on so moving on from here if frame is equal to zero i can start to define some of these var these variables up here so we can start with well it doesn't really matter which we start with we'll say value and that will be equal to zero initially trigger will be equal to an empty list start time will be an empty list and finally current underscore spy will be equal to and it will be zero because that's the current position for the scanner the position y of the scanner now if we select the scanner cube we can see that it is at zero in position y because of course it's grouped into the scanner assembly and they're both at the same position so the local position of the scanner cube will be zero when that's the case and that's fine so that's all good so that's the initialization of our variables and that's all done so we've got it all sorted out here the binary we don't need to do at frame zero because this never changes but these do okay so we can then say if frame oops frame is equal to zero or rather sorry greater than one we've done equals zero and frame and it will be percentage for modulo 35 is equal to zero so once our frame value has hit 35 we're interested in making the scanner move we don't want it to move until it's hit 35 which is why i've put greater than one if we would just said if frame modulo 35 is equal to zero then we could have started moving the scanner at frame zero and i don't want to do that i want it to pause for 35 frames before it does anything so that it's reading this first line of binary code effectively from the card that's what i'm setting that up for 
So we can then say current SPY bracket zero is equal to, and it will be card pos, or rather scanner, it was card originally, scanner <laughs> pos y, because we're interested in what's coming in here. So we want this initial position to be given to current current uh, spy position and of course at the moment it will be zero so they both match at the moment but they won't as type progresses moving on from here we can say if len trigger is less than one trigger dot append one Our next ball of call is if len start time is less than one, start time dot append frame. And I'm not even going to tell you what that does this time because I'm hoping you've done some previous tutorials and you know exactly what I've done there. So let's move on from here. We can then say if len trigger is equal to one. And this is where we start our range mapper and monoflop. So duration is equal to frame minus start time zero. If duration is less than 30, and then we can think about a range mapper. Now, why have I said less than 30 as opposed to 35? Well, basically, I want this to happen over 35 frames, what's going on in here. But the movement of the scanner, I want to take place over 30 frames. I then want it to pause for five frames while it reads the next line and then starts moving again. So that's why I'm using 30 as opposed to 35. So let's see what we can say next. Range mapper is equal to c4d.utils.range map brackets duration comma and it will be 0 comma 30 for the input range and the output range will be 0 comma minus 20 because we want the scanner to move down in blocks of 20 because of course the holes here they're 20 centimeters apart so that's why we need to do that and then it will be comma false because we're using negative values. So we must say false here and then comma spline. And that finishes off the code for our range mapper. We can then say move scanner is equal to and it will be current underscore SPY brackets zero plus range mapper. So whatever our current position y is, we need to add the value, which is going to be a value as a minus value. It's going to be 0 to minus 20, which will move the thing down, obviously. So that will enable the scanner to move down in blocks of 20, as I mentioned earlier. Now, we've got to take this a step further because if we don't, what will happen is the, the scanner will actually move down 20 and then it will jump back to zero if we don't do this next piece of code. So we've got to say value, and this is where this comes in, brackets zero is equal to move underscore scanner. Simple piece of code, but we've just simply got to take this, this value here, whatever this value is, we've got a place in here because this will reset to zero. But once we've stored it in here, this won't change until we actually make the next move. 
So it will actually enable us to hold the scanner at its current position no matter where it is. So that's why this line of code is so important. We can then say else, and it's the usual thing, trigger dot clear and start time dot clear. And then the final line of code is move scanner is equal to value brackets zero as opposed to saying it would be equal to move scanner or rather it would be equal to current rather current current uh, position y so that's very very important this this value here is the key to making this work and that's as much code as we need at the moment and it should all things being fair actually make this work so let's connect these two together that's the last stage and we'll just close this down I think we'll go back to a standard layout for this and hit F1 to get into the 3D view. Right, last thing to do, just give ourselves some more frames. We'll go to about 600 and hit play and see if anything happens. And away it goes. And as you can see, it's doing exactly what I said it would do. It drops by 20 units, pauses and then drops. And that's exactly the motion that we need. So yeah, this is working really nicely. And then we loop back to the top. Now, if we had more than 600 frames, we'd find that the scanner would actually keep on moving downwards and we'd actually get an error in the Python code because it would be looking at something that wasn't actually there. So it would be out of range. It would give us an out of range error of, of some kind there. So in part two, we'll actually correct that. When it gets down to the bottom here, we'll make it go right back up to the top and then start moving down again and repeat the process. We will also be making the scanner actually read what's on the card and convert the binary into decimal and the decimal into letters. And then we'll be making those letters appear on a computer screen. That's what we'll be doing with this in part two. So be sure to tune in for that. But anyway, for now, that just about completes this tutorial. So if you've enjoyed the video, please give it a like. And if you haven't already, then please subscribe to the channel. And of course, leave a comment and ring the bell. And wherever you happen to be on social media, then please, please share this video because all this good stuff helps keep the channel moving in the right direction. But anyway, for now, that just about wraps this one up. So I'll see you very soon for part two.